Hey, it's Alicia from mobilitymastery.com and I'm really excited today because we are kicking off a brand new series that I actually previously did only for my email community. It's called Fast Fascia Facts and we're gonna be doing this for about eight weeks. So stay tuned every week because we're gonna do a new video uh, every week where I'm gonna give you three just boom, 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 fast fascia facts. <laughs> and then I'm gonna tell you why this matters and ask you what your takeaway is about your own life. And we're gonna talk about it in the comment section because what I love about just revealing some of the raw facts about fascia is that you get to come to your own conclusions about what's happening maybe in your own body, in your own mind body space. Uh, and whatever you're currently working on or working through, we'll have some maybe newfound clarity. And if you are brave enough to share in the comments, I just know whatever you share is gonna help someone else. Uh, so stay tuned for the other episodes, but this is episode one. Okay, so let's just dive right in here. Number one is that it is the most abundant tissue. Tissue being, you know, uh, a word I wanna define for you. Um, it's not the most ab abundant substance. I think we all kind of know that that's water. We should have more water than just about anything else in the body, but fascia is the most abundant tissue. Um, now I do want to say that there is some controversy here for me to call it a fact. Um, I just want to own that this is fact to me. It's been a, it's been something that I've discovered and I find to be true. Um, and in researching, I believe it to be true. I encourage you to always do your own research. If you're questioning anything that I'm sharing with you, go research it on your own, feel what it feels like in your own body, share your thoughts below. Um, but I defined it as a tissue, uh, because it wraps, you know, every muscle tissue. It's made up mostly of collagen and um, elastin and it has glycoproteins and other things in it. Um, but it is predominantly a tissue. Some people go so far as to claim that your blood is in fact connect connective tissue or fascia and so are your bones. I'm not taking it quite that far, <laughs> um, but if you did, then it might be right up there with water in terms of the most abundant substance in your body. Um, Number two here, and I'm gonna to get to why they matter in just a minute, but number two here is that fascia wraps not just muscle. So most people think about fascia wrapping muscle. So, you know, there's been a lot of talk about fascia lately. It's kind of a fad word. I've been researching and working with fascia for over a decade now, since 2008. And, you know, back then we talked about it mostly in terms of its connection to muscle fiber and wrapping muscle. And the common kind of descriptor that people use is if you've ever looked at a steak or a piece of chicken, it's the, you know, the clear kind of stretchy stuff or the white stuff in a steak. Um, but it is so much more abundant than that. It actually wraps your bones, it wraps your organs, it wraps your nerves, and it even wraps your blood vessels. So it is extremely, um, abundant and and a predominant part of all of your systems so this is something i definitely encourage you to take into consideration and then we're gonna you know kind of talk about these over the coming weeks with other fascia facts um, and number three this is one of my favorite fascia facts and it has massive implications um, but fascia actually has its own contractile cells that means that fascia can contract independent of muscle tissue. And most of the time when we think of, you know, um, muscle or movement in the body, um, we think of either voluntary or involuntary movement, and usually it's associated with muscles. But the fact that fascia can actually contract on, it, uh, on its own and has its own contractile cells has massive implications for all kinds of things. So that's one of my favorite fascia facts of this whole series. Um, so now I wanna dive into why these matter to me. Um, and then I wanna hear from you and why they matter to you. Uh, so they matter to me for two main reasons. One, I own a body and I am made up of a lot of fascia. So, you know, I've used fascia release uh, to heal my knee pain um, and 
all kinds of other things in my own body and my own life. So I use what I teach you in my own life. And then obviously I had a uh, very successful private practice for a long time, not really working one-on-one -on -one with anyone anymore, but now I'm teaching what I share online and certifying people in my method called kinetics. So it matters to me professionally um, in terms of either working with clients and wanting to get them results and wanting to work with them in an effective way based on both scientific research as well as my own research and our experience when we're working together, whether it's me and a client or me and a group of students or me um, you know, in a room in person or me with my online students. So we're always discovering new things together. So the reason number one matters to me, that it's the most abundant tissue, is if it's the most abundant tissue we have in the body, to me that implies that it's rather critical to know about. <laughs> but for a very, very long time, uh, you know, scientists, researchers, anatomists, um, people studying anatomy, uh, kind of considered it obsolete, like it was just the wrapping and it wasn't important. So for example, in medical school for a long time and probably still today, predominantly, uh, they take it out, they discard it, and then look at what's left and study it. So they study the nerves, they study the bones, they study the muscles, but they don't study fascia um, typically in say, you know, medical setting. Um, there are a lot of people studying fascia now, which is awesome. Um, but to me, if it's the most abundant tissue in the body, I, you know, it's probably important, right? And I wanna know what those roles are because if I own a body and I wanna have optimal health, I probably should focus on one of the most abundant tissues, right? So we're always talking about how important it is to drink water because we're 70% water, but it's not mainstream yet to talk about fascial health, even though that's the predominant tissue that we're made of. Um, so I encourage you to stay tuned for all these other episodes to learn more about this most abundant tissue, but I also would love to know, um, you know, why does that matter to you? If it is the most abundant tissue, does that mean anything to you? Um, so number two, this matters a lot because if fascia is that intimately connected to all these other things in the body, like muscle, bones, organs, nerves, blood vessels, then it implies at least that there's a relationship between fascia and muscle, fascia and bone, fascia and nerves, fascia and organs, fascia and blood vessels, etc. cetera. Um, and if that's true, then um, because you know everything's connected, it's probably worthwhile to understand those individual relationships, but also how they interplay as a whole system because you are a whole person, you're a whole body, you're not just body parts you know, that operate independently, everything is connected. So this has massive implications to me for muscle function, for bone structure alignment, for organ function, which is probably really important. And then nerves, of course, which I talk a lot about here on the channel, um, because fascia wraps every nerve ending, uh, there's a huge, really critical relationship between fascia and the nervous system. Um, and we're gonna dive into that for sure, um, not in this episode. Um, and then finally, this one, my favorite one, um, fascia has its own contractile cells. This feels hugely important to me, has massive implications for all kinds of things. And I will fully admit that some of this is my own theory, my own personal experience with my body and then with clients as well. Um, so these are the facts and then I'm extracting from it somewhat subjective and somewhat objective at times, um, theory and data that I'm relaying to you. So I just wanna own that because um, you know I call myself a citizen scientist sometimes and I'm gathering uh, information and research from my clinical practice, my private practice, right? Um, and working with my own body, but it's not like what I'm sharing with you right now has been verified by some kind of scientific uh, community or, or study or anything like that. Um, but to me, why this matters is because I believe that uh, fascia has been grant like, first of all, it's been granted its own contractile cells. Why? So I like to start there. Probably there's a reason, right? It wasn't just granted them 
just in case it needed to contract, right? If muscle was the only thing that needed to contract in our body to move us or protect us or anything like that, then it probably would you know, be only a function of muscle, but it's not. So I kind of theorized from that, that it was granted that power because most of the time our muscles are moving voluntarily. I mean, sometimes it's involuntary, right? We have to breathe, our heart has to pump um, or you know, beat every day and things do have to happen involuntarily. But I believe that fascia can contract independent of muscle tissue for two primary reasons. Number one, to protect you. Um, and number two, because it's operating at a subconscious level in conjunction with your nervous system, uh, interpreting data, both internally and externally, in order to make sense of your internal world and your external world. And then it needs to, based on that information, cue certain behaviors to keep you alive, to keep you safe. Um, so two main things, right? To keep you functioning and then to keep you safe. So protection. Uh, so to me, the huge implication here is that in my private practice of the last 10 or 11 years, I have, and then talking with all of my online students, I've come to conclude that the number one factor that impacts fascia in a quote negative way, meaning it has a an effect that can cause illness or injury or um, disease or syndromes or anything like that isn't actually, uh, you know, overuse or injury. Those aren't the two things that affect fascia in an, in an ill health manner the most, as you might think. Any guesses what does affect your fascia the most? <laughs> Any guesses? Share it below. Um, it's fear. So, chronic fear or going through a lot of fearful experiences in life or having anxiety or daily stress, which is kind of a fear, is the thing that will make your fascia more brittle, um, more accumulate more tension, um, you know, arrange itself in knots instead of the fluid elastic shape that it's supposed to be in. Um, and a lot of that has to do with these contractile cells. So your, your body is interpreting what's happening in your life um, and it's cueing certain behaviors accordingly. So if you are fearful, your body may interpret that you're in danger and then it contracts to protect you from you know, whatever harm might be in your environment and thus you accumulate tension. So to me, this has huge implications for all kinds of things from autoimmune conditions to you know, things like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and, um, and, and, you know, honestly, even just accumulated tension, right? Um, from the stress of work, money stress, relationship stress, uh, the more stressed we are and the more fearful we are due to that stress, the more our fascia is going to be impacted. And so there's huge implications there. Um, but one other thing just to mention here that, um, got me really thinking about this to begin with a long time ago is that fascia can contract really powerfully um, if you're in acute danger. So for example, if you're in a car accident, if you fall snowboarding, or if you fall, you know, like it's basically when you're, when you have an impact trauma or something, or even an emotional trauma, but it's happening, you know, acutely, it's something really intense, uh, your body, your fascia can contract really powerfully to protect you. So the best example I have to give you visually is whiplash, for example, in a car accident, um, a lot of the time people end up with neck pain and they may go get chiropractic adjustments, they may get massages, and most of the time they're working the posterior side and the, the traps, which feel really tight, um, and that's where the pain is, but that's actually not the problem. What I have found with those people is that their front body, their fascia, was actually locked in a protective um, contraction and hadn't realized it could let go, hadn't realized the danger was over and that car accident may have happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago even. Um, so the reason it will do that and the reason I believe it was granted that power is because if you are in a bad car accident and you're loose, your head can snap backwards, right? And boom, you're dead. Um, so what your body does to protect you involuntarily, right? You are not doing it consciously is it locks down your chest right here. And when I do that, 
like my neck can't really snap back. In order to do that, it's, it's voluntary. I have to make it do it. Um, so it locks everything down so your head can't snap back. But this is definitely true with other things too. If you land on your hip, if you fall on other, you know, if you fall on your wrist or your arm. Um, so when you're searching for the root cause of pain, for example, or injuries, or range of motion issues, that is something you want to take into consideration. Did you ever fall? Have you ever been in a car accident? Um, and obviously I could go on and on and on and on <laughs> about all of this. Um, but like I said, that is my favorite one. There are so many implications for it. So now I'm going to turn it on you. I really want to hear what these mean to you. Like, why do you think they matter to you specifically, to your body, to your condition or whatever you're struggling with right now, whether it's trying to heal emotional trauma or maybe rewire your nervous system, or maybe you're struggling with an acute injury. How do you think these impact you, these facts? And based on what I've shared or based on just the fact itself, what do you think you could do today to take a step forward towards more optimal health? I actually want to put this in your hands now where you are coming up with your own solutions based on what I'm sharing rather than me telling you what to do. Um, I ultimately want to empower all of you to not need me anymore. We can still hang out and be friends. Um, but my real goal is to empower you and educate you so well that you really don't need me. Um, I would prefer that you come up with your own solutions, that you're tuning in, listening to your body and using the knowledge and the wisdom that you've gained um, through research and experience to come up with your own solutions for your body. So please share that below. I can't wait to read these and stay tuned because we have many more episodes of Fascia Facts coming to you over the coming weeks. And yeah, I'm super excited because I'm a nerd and I love this stuff. <laughs> um, if you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And if you'd like to join my email community, which you should, it's great. Uh, we've got some tips, resources, and stories that I share only to my email community, like these flash facts that I did uh, quite a while ago. Um, you can do that by clicking the link below this video. I can't wait to see you in there and I'll see you next time.